All right, so we left off with uh, James arresting a group of Anglican bishops, and uh, again, having them thrown in jail led many to believe that he was going to return England to full Catholicism, and again, we they'd been fighting about that since Henry VIII, so <laughs> they also believed that James was going to uh, turn England into an absolute monarchy, as the French had, okay? Well, all this kind of came to a head with a, an event that surprised most people. 1688, James's wife, Mary of Modena, she's Italian, gave birth to a son, okay? Now, remember, um, <clears throat> his oldest daughter uh, was Mary, and she is the uh, Protestant and married to William of Orange, but the son will automatically become the heir, okay? Because of, you know, the patriarchy. So, with the son uh, being, you know, born, uh, he will be heir to the throne and obviously will be raised Catholic. So at this point, Parliament decided that James had to go. So they will contact Mary, who was living in the Netherlands with William of Orange. Um, he was the Stadtholder, which was like essentially like the leader of Holland. Uh, and he was also the Prince of Orange. And the Orange family was very heavily involved in Dutch politics. So Parliament made the decision to invite, as I put in there, quote, quote, invite William and Mary to England to protect English liberties. So William will land his army in November of 1688. James will flee to France. He thought he would get support from the people, but most people in England were happy to see him go. So he had only ruled for three years, very short term, okay? Um, William and Mary are the only English monarchs to rule as a pair because she was the heir to the throne. She technically had the best claim, but William was asked as well because of his military experience and again, probably because of the patriarchy. So they are the only English monarchs to rule as a pair. And because there was only, uh, there was only one battle and very few people were killed at that battle, um, it was largely a bloodless revolution. It was called the Glorious Revolution. So that will be the, the name given to it, the Glorious Revolution. All right, <clears throat> one of the other things that happened as part of the Glorious Revolution that kind of passed unnoticed at first was that Parliament had also drawn up a document that William and Mary had to accept as part of their invitation, quote unquote invitation, and it was the English Bill of Rights. And you can see it over here in its written form, uh, listing of rights guaranteed to the English people that cannot be taken away. If it sounds familiar, it will be the direct inspiration for our Bill of Rights, okay? Um, but as I mentioned in class, and I may not have mentioned this on the uh, online version of the notes, um, England has no written constitution, okay? In fact, the, the only one they did was uh, the one that they created for Oliver Cromwell, which really wasn't much of anything at all. It's called the Instrument of Government. So um, <clears throat> they didn't have, they don't have a written constitution, and so um, this is how their government works. They work off of uh, founding documents. So the Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights, and then of course like court cases and things like that are the foundation of English law. They do not have a written constitution. Very unusual, um, but it's worked for them, okay? So Parliament is the true lawmaking body that's been established. Catholics are prohibited from holding office and they even outlawed the religion itself in 1689. Uh, they also passed that same year the Toleration Act all forms of Protestantism, except those that denied the Trinity, are now legal, okay? And so, 1701, another law that kind of passed a little unnoticed at the time, uh, that would be a game changer, was the Act of Settlement, okay? So, with William and Mary in office, and uh, at their deaths, the um, next heir was Anne, okay? Anne was the last Stuart monarch. Now, the problem was, Anne was older, um, she, her children um, had been sickly. She only had a few children. So this act of settlement unusually uh, would give her the power, but if she outlived her children, then the throne would pass to the German House of Hanover, which was the nearest relative, okay? And this actually occurred. So when Anne died in 1714, uh, with no children to take effect, we will see a German uh, leader, George I, or George of Hanover, uh, will become George I and become the third foreigner to rule England in a century. So there you go. So that is the uh, aftermath of the English Bill of Rights. All right, so even though the Glorious Revolution was not a mass movement, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't fit in the same way as the French or American revolutions, it did set up a framework of government. Um, again, we see it now as a conservative revolution. Most of the English people did not support 
James's actions uh, to restore Catholicism, which would have been a very radical change. Uh, the revolution will also permanently restrain the monarchy and will affect the uh, influence the American Revolution, okay? Now, we discussed that more in early American history, but the uh, revolutionaries, Washington, Franklin, John Adams, definitely inspired by uh, events that occurred in the Glorious Revolution. It also influenced this guy, English political writer John Locke. Now, John Locke had been a critic of Charles II and James II. Um, Charles accused him of being involved in an assassination plot. Now, I looked this up. Um, pretty, pretty, uh, what we would call circumstantial evidence. Uh, but Locke did not like either Charles or James, so, you know, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. But he will go into exile in the, in the Netherlands, and he will not return until he returns with Mary. So when William and Mary came across uh, with their army to land, John Locke was one of those with them, okay? And so um, he will publish two of his most famous works. Uh, the first one is the Two Treatises of Government, okay? Um, and the notes indicate that he'd actually started it well, you know, before in Charles and James' uh, reigns, but he didn't finish it or publish it until then, okay? So the Two Treatises of Government was first published anonymously, but after Locke died in 1704, it became much more widespread. Um, the first treatise actually discusses an early work by Robert Filmer, and it claimed that effective government was a form of patriarchy. So Locke goes through and refutes this line by line, okay? That part we really don't know. The first treatise being like, eh, we don't really talk about that. The second treatise of government is the one that we really study, okay? This is where Locke says that the relationship between a king and the people is a bilateral contract. If the king broke this contract, the people had a right to rebel. Okay. Now, again, he'd written this earlier, but many perceive the influence for sure of what was going on with James II. So in other words, in his mind, James II um, had broken his contract by trying to impose Catholicism, and therefore the people had a right to remove him. Okay. Locke's work, of course, would be a major, major influence on Thomas Jefferson and writing the Declaration of Independence. Though, of course, ironically, he is saying the opposite and saying that England is no longer governing the American colonies effectively and therefore has to go. All right, so moving on to the French. We're going to spend some time with the French for a while, okay? Now, in England, absolutism did not work. We saw that. Cromwell, you know, as soon as he was gone, as soon as they brought back, you know, King Charles II, um, they were back to a monarchy, okay? And they were back to um, a, you know, parliament that had a say-so in what was going on. Now, France's situation is different. Absolutism will work, okay? It works because they don't have that history of constitutionalism. Um, the religious disorder had lasted a lot longer. It had been a lot bloodier. Um, they'd had, you know, essentially they had a, an ongoing civil war for, you know, 100 years with the Huguenots and the Catholics. So their civil war really was a constant thing. Well, with Henry IV taking power, Henry of Navarre taking power in 1589, um, he will kind of pull together the country. Um, he wanted to rein in the nobility because he felt that they had caused a lot of the issues. Remember, this is, you know, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre was just a decade old and still fresh in their minds. But Henry had also done a very interesting thing. He was a Huguenot, but he converted to Catholicism in order to secure the throne, okay? And remember that famous quote, uh, Paris is well worth a mass. And so he thought that by one, being a Huguenot leader converting to Catholicism, he would bring the country together. Okay. Two, he also thought that by, you know, eliminating the religious issues, France could grow. They knew they were falling behind England. They knew they needed power. And so he thought the only way was to bring the nation together. And, you know, the only way that was going to happen is to somehow rein in all of these um, issues that were causing problems. Um, the one he really wanted to keep in check was the Parlement. Okay. The Parlement were basically local governing bodies in French cities and towns. The Paris Parlement really thought that it was the true power source in the country. Okay. Now, was it? No. But they thought that, and they acted that way. So he wants to keep them in check. He put in a new finance minister, the Duke of Sully. He will expand the reach of Henry IV with uh, monopolies. He will monopolize the gunpowder, the salt, and the metals trades. He also employs a very controversial tax called the corvée, okay? Now the corvée is basically that you owed the country labor. And the big thing was you would uh, be drafted to work on roads. Now, 
The thing about the Corvée is it sounds all well and good. Hey, let's build the roads. The problem is, is that it was, of course, like a lot of things, used in um, vindictive ways. Like, for example, the leader of a town might have, you know, a buddy of his who has a monopoly on, you know, barrel making. So he might have the, you know, other uh, rival barrel maker, you know, in the town uh, be put on the corvée duty so that this guy can make money. And that was the other thing is that workers drafted uh, to do the corvée were typically drawn from the middle and lower classes. Wealthy people were not doing this. So again, controversial labor tax, most of the labor being done by the poor and the middle class, benefiting the rich. Okay. Uh, they also planned a pretty audacious canal system. They wanted to use the rivers of France uh, to connect the uh, Atlantic to the Mediterranean and build some sort of a canal. Didn't work, never happened, but they did, you know, that was one of their plans. All right, so Henry, despite his, you know, capitalization, capitalization on the power, uh, was very unpopular even with Huguenots, okay? Now, you think about it, though. Um, Huguenots were mad at him for uh, basically turning away from the religion to go back to Catholicism, and the Catholics didn't believe that he was actually a real Catholic, that he was somehow faking it. So he was a target of 12 assassination attempts, 12 that we know of. There probably were more. Finally, in 1610, he was traveling in a carriage to visit the Duke of Sully and a Catholic fanatic, Francois Ravelat, is going to uh, run up to his carriage, uh, lean in, and stab him. Um, <clears throat> he dies, okay? Uh, in fact, he, he barely made it to the hospital. Uh, by the way, Francois was um, tortured and executed in a very horrific way. He was drawn and quartered. Yeah, so he did pay the price for what he did. 1611, Sully is going to retire, and Henry's wife, Marie de' Medici, is now the regent. The heir, Louis XIII, was only nine years old, so he was not ready to take power. So Marie, who is a Italian, uh, not very popular, nobility didn't like her, and so she thought that by allying herself with the Spanish, she could improve Louis's position. So with Henry's death, more flux and turmoil in France, okay? Well, in 1611, Louis would, uh, they made a treaty, the Treaty of Fontainebleau, with the Spanish. Under this treaty, Louis would marry the Spanish Infanta, the infant daughter. His sister Elizabeth would marry the heir to the Spanish throne. And then they signed a 10-year defense pact between the two nations. Okay? All right. We will pick up next with Cardinal Richelieu, because there's a lot to this guy. <laughs>